Mr. Turpy, stand up, stand up. Remember him? He's the guy who got on the stand, and he looked at you in eye to eye. And he said unequivocally, I never saw Ted Binion on the 17th. I was not in the house on the 17th. I had nothing to do with the death of Ted Binion. You saw him. You were here. You heard him. You looked at him. What more can an innocent person do? He's innocent! There's an old adage in the prosecution world. Ooh, it's easy to convict the guilty. The real challenge is to convict the innocent. Six o'clock tonight. Uh, I gave you two different ones. Both of them we can't get. Um, no, the, the, this one, this is every. Well, yeah, this is everything except for that. There, there's an audio file on there that we would have to have. I think it's a very different type of office than most uh, law offices. It's certainly. Uh, you know, a community of um, lawyers that dedicate themselves to criminal law and legalizing marijuana. So it's all good. Oh, shit. Ugh. Don't ever get old. Yeah. How you doing, Mr. Sir? Hi, man. Thank I need a lawyer. <laughs> you have a good day. All right, you too. Tony Sarah is a legend. <laughs> Tony sarah has got fucking bad hips. Long time, haven't you? Where have you been? I've been in every court around here, but I'm I'm strong and I'm You're doing back. it. You're back. <laughs> Omar, when they like you, it means that you're headed for the grave. Oh, yes, yes. Good morning, Your Honor. Nancy Tom for the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Tony Sarah for Mr. Johnson. Behind us is the image of uh, almighty legal authority in the face, you know, of uh, the United States. So this is the very court where the Judy Barry case, I was part of that, was litigated and we were alleging misconduct on the part of the FBI and the local police. We got, uh, as I recall, 2.4 million or 3.2 million. So this is the largest uh, uh, judgment uh, against the FBI for violation mostly of Fifth and Fourth Amendments. I think, you know, from early childhood, uh, the uh, notion of putting human beings in steel cages was vividly abhorrent to me. And so part of the component of my, what would you call it, uh, uh, career endeavor is to keep people out of st steel cages. Yeah. I've been convicted in three separate occasions over 30 years, and I've gone to federal uh, prison twice, uh, one time given straight probation. But the bar deems it actually laudable, no, no mens rea, uh, no uh, uh, you know, moral turpitude, and therefore I don't lose my uh, license. I was, a, I was a teenage uh, kid, probably 19 years old, and got involved with this case 
of this man who had been wrongfully uh, convicted of murder was on death row. We didn't have a lawyer and no money. And so Tony uh, came on and, uh, and, and took the case. And, and I remember sitting in court watching uh, Tony try this case. We'd, you know, this is an immigrant community, a new community that had you know, very little uh, knowledge of how the system worked. And to have Tony do the case was just phenomenal. And I can still remember it now. And I was in court uh, when, uh, when he was acquitted. Uh, the, the, the best thing about that moment was that everyone, he, he, he was given an opportunity to speak, and everyone believed that, that he would say, oh, the system you know, valid, was validated, and I'm, you know, happy for my acquittal and my due process. No, he turned to the prosecutor, remember, and he started saying something like, you know I was innocent, you are, he started yelling at him, I'm going, this guy's great, like, you yeah. know, like <laughs> destroys the system of justice. You see, what happens now is in the federal system, in, in a lot of drug cases, and spilled over to white collar crime and every other level, the people turn on the dissident voice. Someone wants to go to jury trial, oh, they'll roll the top on them, they'll roll the bottom, that means they'll give them lighter sentences or great the leniency or other forms of consideration in order to become a government witness. And so ultimately there's no trials in these cases because you've got all of these cooperating witnesses. It destroys the adversarial system. It makes it a totalitarianistic system. People run in who are arrested in order to be the first to snitch because they get the best deal. And most of the time they lie. They must tell the prosecutor what the prosecutor wants to hear. You know, we don't have enough evidence on, on Joe Schmo. Well, I don't really know Joe Schmo thinks the informant. The, ju the lawyer nudges him. You better tell him about Joe Snow, you know? And so he makes up stuff. Why? He wants to get his deal. He wants the leniency. Just like coerced confessions are unreliable, the word of a snitch because they're doing it to save their own skin is unreliable per se. This is medicine for a lawyer that has a recommendation, completely legal, California, you know, our champagne, our product, uh, the product that we pride ourselves in, which is the basis of much of Northern California economies. And it looks fantastic. This key I've had for about 45 years. I have match books I've collected over a lifetime. Those, that is valuable. When I die, you know, I don't believe in probate, but I'll tell one of my kids, get those matches. And the next thing I have is ties. I got ties that have been eaten by moss. I got ties, you know, that have been regurgitated upon. I got all kinds of ties. So you can see them on the wall here and here and then here. When you started as a lawyer in my ear a long time ago, you, you had to wear a suit and a tie, as I have on now. And it was very constrained. Remember the man, you know, in the gray final suit the, was the image. So it was very, it was conventional, it was dogmatic, it was ruthless in terms of imposing entire attire on professional people, and everybody looked alike. And the only little place you could sneak out and be individual, you know, and create something that was meaningful was your tie. Ah, oh, I would look at people, I wouldn't look at their clothes, men, lawyers, even judges, I don't even look at their clothes, it's all the same shit. Look at their tie. Their mother did walk into the ocean in the middle of the night and drown herself. Whatever that created in, in 
their life and however that came out in their interaction or whatever that might have magnified and you know whatever whatever that did I'm sure accounts for a lot of why they don't talk and I think uh, made deep 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 impressions on them and how they relate to people and how they relate to their work oh Richard's a great guy Richard did, yeah Richard paid for all of our college and we could spend hours talking about Richard we're not gonna but Richard's an incredible you know, man too. I, th I think by calling himself a semantic warrior, uh, it's a way of drawing the lines and saying, I remember going to court with him as a kid and he wouldn't introduce me to the DA except for that's the enemy. A certain power he has with words. And you can call it love, you can call it charisma, you feel it when you're in the room with him.